Welcome to another Global Soul conversation. Yes, sir. We have some serious history, British history in the room. 30 years of history between us three. Yes. And we're going to talk about it. We have Touch Magazine founders, myself and Jamie, and founder of The Influence, Kwame. I wouldn't even call myself a founder, actually. Okay. Well, we'll get into that. Yeah, I would. So, let me set the scene a bit. 30 what? years ago, we're talking late 80s, yes. early 90s. Yes. At that time, uh, it was the height of rave culture. Yeah. Uh, soul to soul, we're just conquering the world. Yeah. And something fairly significant happened in the media industry. Uh, a previously restrictive radio industry opened up, and a radio station called Kiss FM was granted a license, and that's where story I guess begins particularly for Jamie and I um, because they had a magazine called Free Magazine which was running um, to keep in contact with listeners while they went off air and because KISS eventually got a license I was working for the magazine at the time because KISS got a license a lot of the key team which was Hedy Greenwood and a guy called Lindsay Wesker who was the editor and mm. of the magazine had to move over to the radio station mm. Lindsay Wesker became head of music he came from a long journalistic background of echoes and stuff and the editor that came in to replace Lindsay was one Jamie DeGree. Oh, you see, I didn't know that. Yeah, but I, but I actually started off as a cartoonist. Oh, wow. um, oh God, yeah. Because basically I went to a meeting and... Are you saying you were a joke? The magazine was rubbish. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Basically, and I went to a couple of editorial meetings and said, why is your magazine so rubbish? And they said, you do it then. What, <laughs> yeah, Lindsay said, well, you do it then. I was like, all right. Um, so I started doing like... I was, I was already doing cartoons. Right. That's why I was even allowed to be at the meetings in the first place. Yeah. But I said that cartoons. I would probably um, do it in a different way. Not a better way, but a different way. And at <laughs> Lindsay, turned out to be better. Yeah, Lindsay was busy, to be fair, um, running the radio station. Right. So, and it was all um, it was all a bit of a kind of made up as we went along, wasn't it? Like, you know, we sort of, I suddenly had a job as an editor, which was just an actual job title that didn't make any sense because who knew what an editor did right. um, but then there was JM and there was um, Bill Tucky there was Jonathan Taylor mm. there was obviously like a really good team of people that came like that the that Heritage of Kiss you know Paul Trouble Anderson was you know already involved you know Trevor Nelson was already involved um, there was that basically Kiss brought a lot of talent with them but I guess the whole story of Touch's Genesis was that it started off as a free magazine and then we had to become our own thing. So yeah, so I, I mean, when it was Free Magazine, because of the whole team moved out, I was given responsibility for running it. And we um, we did pretty well. We had uh, quite a successful time. And it was felt that, the, that we'd run our time with KISS. Um, there was no longer a need for KISS to have a magazine. It was becoming a distraction. Um, so uh, from KISS's point of view, they felt enough. Um, but from our point of view, as the team who were running it, we felt, well, actually, we built something quite good here. And this, this put in context, at the time, um, free magazines were, or free anything, was a bit of an anathema. Yeah. Um, at the time, there was, you know, obviously now you have Metro, which is not yeah. very successful. Free Standard. Paper. It's, now, it's now part and part of the media industry that you have free pay, three mm. papers, three magazines. But at the time, it was like... The really Face s- magazine, yeah, ID was- magazine, it was like stuff you actually had to buy and pay for and kind of like invest in into a little bit. So, and I always thought, actually... The fact that it was it wasn't only call free well it wasn't only free it was actually call free and it was mm. like it was a, a bit of a double devaluation in a way mm. that um i thought we needed to maybe bring a bit of value to so so initially what we did was the the team which was me uh, jamie bill and a guy called dave lambert um we sort of said well we should probably just continue this and we decided to start a new magazine which was a continuation of free and we named it Touch, and we came out pretty quickly, didn't we? There wasn't really much of a gap. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we found offices in Brixton. And we stuff. were sacked at Christmas, I remember. We were basically given our letters at Christmas time. And the last issue of Free Magazine was like, oh yeah, guess what, boys? That's your last magazine. We're like, okay, great. And then we we were up and running by March, the March issue, which came out in February. So it was like a two, three month delay. And, and the other thing, the other thing that I think it gave us was it gave us a lot more editorial freedom. Um, to no longer be part of another media organisation yeah. and we could say whatever we wanted about whoever we wanted um, and so I think that, that sort of helped as well and and I guess sort of where bringing it back around to the influence I mean the first time I remember distinctly I remember the day it happened the mm. first time I came across the influence was we were free magazine at the time 
we were in the um, Blackstock Road offices mm. and Eddie came in, Eddie Piller came in, who, who I'd known for yeah. a while anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, through, uh, through his gig that he used to do in Chingford and stuff I used to go to all the time. Yeah. And he came in and he brought some records in to give to the, you know, the DJs for, uh, that, that were often coming into to Blackstock Road and, and also for us a, a free magazine. And amongst those records mm. was a Dean Flynn's record, right? Um, which was your first release. I didn't I, at that time. I didn't know you or any of the people yeah. behind it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's the that was my first introduction. To, I'm the one to Dean Flynn. I'm the one. Yeah. I'm the one. Yeah. So, so, so talk us through from in terms of your journey. How did you end up with Acid Jazz? How did Dean Flynn's come together? What happened? Wow. Okay. So you have Steve Marston, who sadly has passed away now uh, passed away I think 2010 but um, Steve was a regular just on the scene as a player so he played saxophone and he did sessions for people Steve played for a lot of you know big soul acts I think he played for Shaka once he's played for, he played for various people um he, he also, Steve also, just used to come and kip at my house. So if he was in the area, he just used to call up. Sometimes didn't, sometimes he'd just come, knock on the door, and if somebody else opened the door, he'd just come in. And uh, he just used to kip at my place. He used to like just kip in there. He used to say it felt like he was, because I was in Crouch End, he said he used to feel like he was in the country. Anyway, Steve um, just one day said, look, we are... He said, there's a group of people in Shepherd's Bush. He said, you should, you know, come and check out. And I just left. I've been in this sort of school band that I've been in for a while, past school sort of thing. And I was like, oh, you know, fine, just tell me, tell me where. And he said, Shepherd's Bush, come down, check them out, whatever. So I go down to this um, basement, much like the one we're sitting here. And uh, there's this guy there called Ned Bigham, who had some computer gear and whatever, and he was just putting these beats together. And uh, so there was him, um, and there was Ajax Scott. Ajax Scott was much more like a sort of record collector, and he just had this amazing collection of records that were just on hand. So they were, again, much like here, you see these records here. There was sort of, he had walls and walls of them in his, in his room. And so we were able, he just he'd say, come up and just nick a few. So we'd nick some, go downstairs. And it's this whole thing of tech at the same time. Uh, samplers, weirdly, there's one in here, which is an Akai S1000 samplers had really just become the, you know, the thing. They were getting a bit more sophisticated as well, which meant the amount of time that you could, I guess, sample either a drum loop or whatever for had just grown a bit longer. So the meeting of tech, plus the fact that we had old records there, which then meant we could take snares from old records and basically use them on our records. So we loved this idea of basically being musical magpies, really. This whole thing of, oh, we could have a bit of that. And oh, we almost dared ourselves to sort of creep as close to an old song as possible, but not totally skin it, do you know what I mean? So it was, it was that. And we just loved doing that. And we, you know, so there was that, um, I don't know. We, we had, they had already done a song. There was a song that when I came downstairs the first time, I said, play me what you've been working on. And they said, oh, they said this. And they played me a tune called The Classic, like straight off. And I was like, wow. <laughs> I said, and they said, what would you do with this? Is there anything that you would add? You know, Steve was like, anything that you would add? And I said, no. I said, probably there's a tiny little bit more break in this section. I said, other than that, no. I said, I can't really add to this. I said, I'll tell you what though. So if you're gonna put it out as a record, I said, you probably should have a vocal track on the other side. So they were like, fine, all right, no problem. So they were like, all right, well, what do we do? So we get to, we, you know, we get to sampling and blah, and this and that, and we come with this 
pretty soon, you know, I've put a bass line, a drum, and Ned's come with his drums, I've come with his bass line, and then this guy called Ed comes down the stairs, and they said, oh, yeah, he's, he plays keyboards as well, and I was like, all right, fine, so he comes down and he puts down, I think he puts down these chords, so either Ned or Ed put down these chords, whatever, and that was it, it's done. Actually, I think it was Ned. Ned put down the chords, Ed was just around. So, that was really... You forgot his name, there was a Ned and a Ned. I know, I know, it was tricky. But that was that was it. So, we, we had done this, and at this point they were like, okay, yeah, so you spoke with our vocalist? And I was like, actually, yeah, that's a point. But, I had been a compere in this club, Borderline, for two years, a club called Backstage which hosted live music. So there was that, which meant that, you know, after backstage, you might go down to heaven, there was a thing called Lady Caroline's Jam. She had this jam session, and at that jam session, Noel Rogers was down there, people from different bands used to just be, down, just casually walk in and just start playing. So you used to go down there just to listen to the talent. Anyway, it's on the mic, hardly not really able to hear her was this girl who just I just remember thought looked just amazing she had this huge beehive you know but it was like an afro beehive and I just thought I'd just never seen anything like it great construction and so it was her and she just had something and it was funny because lots of people were singing she was just doing background vocals and you, well, you could hardly hear her, but we were just like, there's something there. I remember Steve, both of us said, and I said, I said, I said to Steve, I said, do you remember that girl? I said, there was a girl, she was on the mic, blah, blah, blah. He said, yeah, yeah. I said, let's go. So he said, let's go back down to heaven and we'll see if she's there. And we went down and she was there. So we just said, look, here, give us a call, blah, this, that, one. And she said, yeah, all right, fine. So she just gave us a call, um, came down to the studio, listen to the backing track. She said, yeah, I could do something on this. I could do something on this. And it was all, it was kind of really loose. It was just, yeah, see something on it. Fine, fine, blah, this, that, whatever. And then I remember a couple of days before the studio, I think we'd said, you know, before really, I, I'd said to her, I said, hold on. I said, Chosen, you just, I said, could you sing or something? She was like, yeah. And she started, she sang Prince Forever I Want You In My Life. And I just, I just remember my jaw just hit the floor. So it's this soul, you know, Sarah, she's got this, this deep sort of soulful thing. She makes you feel like, she can be seeing something for the first time and she can make you feel as though it's, you've got it in your record collection. Like, it's authentic. Her voice is so authentic. So um, I just was just like, you're bloody amazing. All right, let's, let's go. Let's, you know, so she came down, went to the studio, she said, you know, we came, she came with an idea um, and, and we had sampled, we'd sampled a bit of an old tune and, and we'd used that for the chorus and then she was like, right, she just wove in between, came with this verse, verse had a great positive message, all this stuff and it just, everything just fit together. But it was all, it was jigsaw like, nothing was a strain, it was all, which, for me, it was quite odd because the band that I'd been in probably before, and, I, and in fact, I'd been in about three or four different bands, everything was always quite, you know, it's quite tricky to, you know, you know laboured over stuff for quite a long time. And was this something you always wanted to do? Was this like your dream, if you like? Yeah, well, I, yeah, I had, uh, uh, yes, I, from about 15, 16, I wanted to be in bands. And I was in, I was a formerly school band and all of that. And that was fine and that was good. And I loved doing that. And then I had at the time kind of being, in, as I said, about four different bands because I just wanted to eat the amount of experience that I could. So by doing that and then doing the uh, comparing, comparing you were seven bands a night. Do you know what I mean? So I was seeing a lot of music, hearing a lot of music, being around a lot of music. My address book was getting thicker. All of that was happening. But with the influence I just, and weirdly I'd had this whole big argument with a guy 
who is a friend of mine who's a DJ, who just said, look, man, he said, I see you out at clubs. And he said, all the stuff you play me that you're working on, he says, none of it sounds like the way you dance. He says, you just dance and you keep going and keep going and keep going. He said, he said, you clearly love it. I was like, yeah. He said, why don't you do that music? <laughs> Make well, your own music. And I was like, dancing. what? He said, just do the music like that. And I was like, and I was, at first I was like, no, I am, no, my mama. You know, which translates as no. <laughs> and um, he, I remember I went to sleep, woke up the next morning. You know, sleep's a wonderful, it's like balm, isn't it? You wake up in the morning and my brain just had sorted it out. It just went, yeah, he was right. And really, a few weeks later, Steve had said, come down. I'd gone down and it was just everything we did. It was just like that. Just a click, 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 click. It was all just... So you've explained how it all came together. So how yeah. did that then lead to you getting your first record deal with Eddie, Eddie Pillar and Jasper Jones? Again, so lots of logical things where really, which again, it wouldn't happen today. They're of the time. So you've got the first thing, right? The first thing is, is that, and this will sound mad, but Steve had an Admobile. Now, if anybody knows an Admobile, they're like those, those lorries that have ads on them. And you have the driver in the front, and it's a, quite a long, you know, and, this, and you, you, the driver drives. Now, the thing about an Admobile is, if you look at it, it's, it forms a, a triangle. So where you've got the poster on one side, that's on one side of the triangle. Poster on the other side, that's on the other side of the triangle. And the bottom is facing the base of the triangle. Now, the thing about that that was really handy for de-influence was the centre was free, which is where we put our records. So we put our records in there. We just, just decided, that, again, there was another thing. White labels at the time were, everybody was just like, white label and out. That was so it. you pressed up your first thing, Yeah, so. our thing was when the whole attitude, and again, a lot of that had come, Jazzy had a lot to do with that, you know. Jazzy and Soul to Soul had influenced us in a huge way because their thing was, no, nah, man, we're just, we're going to make like music like, like we dance to. And we were just like, wow, okay, so you can do that. Right, great, so you don't have to water it down. No, just press up your own white label. So we were like, right, we're just going to, because we'd been for one meeting with a record label and they had told us, oh, your sound's a bit, remember them saying it's a bit stripped back. And we were like, that's the point. And they were like, well, you need more stuff in there. We were like, later. So we just pressed our own record up. We pressed our own set of 500 up. We borrowed money off of loads of our mates and ourselves, and then just said, we'll pay you back. And we paid them all back, you know, printed up the records and then put them in the center, that space of the Admobile. And of course, it meant that Steve <coughs> was getting paid to drive the Admobile, but also, we were distributing <laughs> right the way across England. We were Coventry, blah, this, that. But it was a tremendous experience because as anybody knows from that time, the fear, right? If you had a record and the record wasn't like hot in some kind of way and you were trying to flog it, sale or return, nobody's taking it. Mm. They're not taking it because space. They haven't got the space back there. So you had to be coming with something that was fire. And there was no, nothing more satisfying than, you know, you either go to Black Market, Mickey D's downstairs, and you just go, listen, here's a box, right? And he's like, let me listen to it. He puts it on and he's like, hmm, I kind of like this, you know? <laughs> he was like, we were like, yeah, yeah. He's like, okay. He said, I'll take a box. So we went back three, four days later, and he said, they're all gone. And all, we were just like, what? He said, they're all gone. He said, you, I guess I'll take a couple more boxes. I'm like, really? He said, yeah. So we go, we deliver these boxes around and we realise we're on our second run now of boxes. And we're like, wow. At the same time, on that road, if you imagine you've got Black Market on one side and I think on the other side is either, what was it? What was it? Not, well, which? No, not Wild Pitch, it was a no. Pitch, um, Uptown or Uptown, something like that. Yeah. So Uptown was on the other side. So we dropped some off at Uptown, we dropped some off at whatever, you know, at Black Market. And we just thought, hold on a minute, 
loads of DJs are walking into these these record shops. We're like, hold on, why don't the people that don't buy it will just give some away to? So we were just like, yeah. So we just started giving some. People, as people came out, we just looked in, saw if they didn't get it, we just give, 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 and we just gave. Because we thought, if they play it, we've, we've done it, right? And one of those was this tall dude. And he's like, yo, dog. And we're like, all right. And we realise it's Tim Westwood. And we've given him a record. And I'm thinking, there's no way he's going to play it. He plays rap. And he went on his show, and he played Capital. Away. In amongst all of these, he was American, 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 British soul band. Did you know American Tim Westwood you were giving it to? Yeah, but we only worked out like right at the end because he was just like, yeah, 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 I'll give it. Okay. So literally, he just was like, all right, fine. He said, he said, I, he said, I'll listen to it. If it's any good, I'll play it. Like that. And that was it. And he just played it. And he played it. And once he played it, Eddie Pillar heard it on Capitol. And Eddie had been talking to us a bit before because it had been being played on pirate radio and whatever. But after it got played on Capital, he was like, listen, get down here now, blah, 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 blah. So he gave us a contract like, straight away. So we were like, all right, fine. And we were like, we're only going to do two singles with you guys. And he was like, fine, fine. He said, I probably won't be able to keep you anyway. <laughs> that was it. And uh, we signed a two single deal. Um, uh, and I'm the one DJ charts wise, just stormed it. State was like number one for a little while, and and I just remember hearing it out of cars and in raves and mm. all sorts. I, you know. Well, Jamie, what's your earliest re recollection of the? Influence? Well, it's really interesting hearing Kwame talk about the classic as the track, and he was basically making the B side. Yeah. Was actually the classic is the B side. Yeah. And the classic is a great track. But the A side is one yeah. one, yeah. and I remember it was weird because I was at, I was living in West London at the time, and um, I was sharing flat with a couple of friends. And the girl I was living with then, she was working at Acid Jazz, mm. and she brought home the white label. She was like, "Oh, is this?" I was like, "What? What the fuck is this?" It was like, it, and that was the thing. Weirdly, even last night, uh, um, we were at your missus's club yeah, in Brixton, yeah. Mobile Mondays, yeah. and I was talking to some of the like people that remember that time, and we were talk we were actually having this interesting conversation about Iron One as being just a weird record, yeah. didn't really fit. Uh. Were like, and I, I guess in the way club culture was at that time, we'd all come from a world of, you know, I think we all at that time remembered when everyone played everything and then yeah. it all diversified so yeah. it was a hip-hop night or an electro night or a house night or a soul night or whatever. and suddenly there was this record a bit like and even though it's a very different record um this brutal house by nitro deluxe which had probably come out in 85 mm. 84 85 just kind of was like a weird record it didn't really fit mm. and i guess that would now with hindsight you look back and they go oh that's the first house record or one of the very first house records mm. and i think with i'm the one because it didn't fit it was in a in a good way. Everyone could play it because yeah. if you're a hip hop DJ, you're not going to play a soul track, and if you're a house DJ, you're not going to play a reggae track. But weirdly, sort of everyone played on the one, mm. so it had that kind of quite ubiquitous. Everyone knew it didn't really fit, but it was kind of like relevant to everyone. And it had the other interesting thing you said, Kwame, was that um, the idea that you are going to rave in a certain way, and you're kind of waiting for the track for you, so you go and make the track. Which I guess is in a way similar to Fair Play, my yeah. soul, soul. Right. and I guess there's that lineage, isn't there, with yeah. um, Jazzy? When, when Fair Play came out, that kind of shook everyone mm. in a sort of similar way to I'm the One because mm. it it didn't fit. Everyone loved it, and um, yeah. So my first recollection was when my flatmate brought it back as a white label, and then maybe uh, I'm not I can't remember. It was six months or a year later, but it was on like, Acid Jazz, and I guess then I was. Um, it was the early days of Touch, probably still Free Magazine. But it was a very much a, in a good way, a crossover, not in what we normally mean by crossover, yeah. the underground and the mainstream, but this was a crossover in our world, which was like, everyone liked it. Yeah. And um, I guess that was the power of it. Yeah. I mean, the thing was, we what, there were, you know, when we, our, our, you know, our way of looking at it was really, in the studio, we were like, look, we loved the hip hop that was going on. So our thing was, Okay, so the drums have to be as good as a hip-hop record, mm -hmm. 
And that was our thing. The drums have got to be as good as a hip hop record. So this was this whole thing about, you know, it was, as I was saying, the record label that we went to see were like, yeah, but your stuff's like really sparse. Well, we're like, actually, you listen to good hip hop records. Yeah. They seem like. Thank really, you for really that sparse. comment. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, a, that's yeah. a good thing that it's yeah, sparse. Yeah, absolutely. So we were like, nah, so you're obviously not the right person. So it's this <laughs> thing of like, you know, so we were like, okay, bass and drums have got to be like totally locked. You know, um, uh, so that was, it was really, really important. But then we were song people, so we loved voices as well. But and it just so happened that we had this. And at the time, Sarah was seventeen years old. That's the thing a lot of people don't realise she was seventeen, and she had smacked this vocal that was just like soul heaven. It's like, you know, but it was also London as well, like really, really London. And and you know, yeah. So, I mean, I guess it's, it's an interesting story because we kind of were all in our various journeys. We were yeah. all starting out around the same time. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. this is 1990 now. Yeah. You're smashing it with your first single. Yeah. Um, 1990 was kind of the end of Free. 1991 is then um, Touch Magazine. Yeah. And, and when did you then sort of get to Warner's and, and the Warner's thing happen? And what happened after the, the, the first smash? What had that transition into Warner's and stuff? Well... Okay, so you do, you do, I'm the one, and after doing I'm the one, we're kind of like, well, and even, by the way, we'd done I'm the one, and we hadn't even chosen a name for the band, right? And we were about, to, we had pressed... So on what label, what did you put on Hold on, hold on, so check it. We hadn't, we hadn't thought yeah. of a name yeah, for the right. band, yeah, and yeah. then what happened was, <clears throat> was that there's a couple of, a few merry accidents, one, we were in Shepherd's Bush. At the time, right, and this is no word of a lie, Shepherd's Bush was home to QPR. QPR at the time was sponsored by Influence. <laughs> Are you joking? No, no. They were so, the people, football fans were walking around, they had the shirt and it had Influence written on the front, right? <laughs> and it was either QPR, it was one of those teams, literally, they had influence, because we used to see these, and they had influence, we were like, all oh, right, yeah, we like influence, we were, and you got to remember, we had pressed, the, and everybody was like, what are we going to call ourselves? Yeah, was the like, merch is already done, if you call yourself. <laughs> so, <laughs> Most people already got in there. <laughs> just had this school of D in front of it. Yeah, so it was like, what are we going to call ourselves? What are we going to call ourselves? So somebody said, it was like, influence, and it was one of those, I can't remember who said it, it was like, literally just, Influence, influence. And we were all like, it can't be just influence. It's got to be influence, influence. What is it? So someone was like, oh, the influence, the influence. And we were like, nah, you can't the, the, it's, it's all wrong. And then, so, and then it was like, it was literally, it was somebody just went, D, D influence, D influence. And it was that quick. The, the, I told my missus and she made, because she's, a jeweler, but she's also a design person. So she made this stamp for the white label, and it had the influence, and it and it was a, she made it a cast, and that you had the rubber then was cast from that, and it had the influence there with a little logo, and then it had a phone number underneath it, and the phone number I can't remember with it wasn't the no it was a, oh one yeah it was one, <laughs> right and it, it, that was it so. And it went out like that. And again, so how this all plays in is that the record gets sold, gets sold at black market, etc. this, that. Mickey D is then being phoned at the time and courted by Warner Brothers, who say to him, listen, keep sending us through stuff that's hot on the street in the UK. And of course, we had been down to his store to black market, so he added our tune, which was obviously, you know, flying off his shelf. So he, he was like, all right, here. So he sends that to them, and it's got the stamp mark on it with the phone number. So we get a phone, I get a phone number, we get a phone call, and I think it's one of my mates taking a piss. No, I absolutely did. Because it's, hi, hi, this is, and I can't remember what her name was, Meryl or something. 
Hi, this is Marin from Sylvia Rohn's office. It was like that. And I was like, yeah, right. I said, which one of my mates is it? Who is it? Like this. I was going like this. I honestly thought it was a joke. And they said, no, no, it really is. It just knew it was one of these. So I was just like, what? I was like, oh, what are you talking about? We're calling from America. It's like, all of this. I was just like, what? What? I said, come on. I said, who is it? Who is it? Like this. And f they keep talking and the wo woman comes on the line and she's like, no, 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 really. She said, we really, we really, hold on. And she gets Merlin Bob and Merlin's like, hi, we're going to be coming over, coming over to the UK. You know, uh, we want to see a couple of people, blah, blah, blah. You, you know of someone called Omar? And we were like, yeah. And they were like, well, we're going to come and see him. And I thought, well, it must be legit, right? So I was like, okay, cool, we'll come for a meeting. Come, we'll, we'll meet you. So they, we arranged the meeting. <clears throat> As you had no WhatsApp, no phone, no... Well, yeah. And also explain, like, these are, like, big American records there. Yeah. They're, yeah. like... Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. huge. Merlin Bob and Silver Rose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Like, Atlantic Records, all right? They're, yeah. like, they're yeah. like, big people. And, yeah, and that's the thing. We've gone from... On, 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 like, on a landline. Yeah, land, <laughs> exactly. Landline. We're pressing our own records with a potato stand near enough. And, and also, to put it in further context, that's... That's kind of bypass the UK of yeah. Warner's, and this yeah, is like the big, yeah. the big part of Warner's, yeah. the main head office. Yeah, yeah. Which, which which played a major part in our story because I know that for a lot of a lot of people really like the fact that we had bypassed mm. UK record labels. That's important because and and the thing was, was the US label at the time they were literally like no 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 just give it to us like that source like full mm. source and we were like wow. Like, you just want it, you're not going to change it, because that was our thing. You can't change anything, mm. right? They were like, okay, because they even said to us, okay, are you going to get anybody to produce you? But we were like, no. Well, it's going to be us producing it. We don't care if we have to learn on the job. This is how it is. And they were like, okay. You know, it's one of those ones where, hey, all right, all right, play your three tunes. And uh, so we've gone, we've had the meet, we did meeting, we're meeting, uh, and again, uh, we'd forgotten. So what happened was, <laughs> and this is very, you know, Merlin walks in. He says, oh, look. He says, uh, what have you got? Have you got something to play? Like this. And I was like, yeah, yeah. He says, uh, here. So I give him a dad. So it's got three tunes on it. So all right, fine. <laughs> Hand it over. Silks. And which tunes are they? Um... If I remember correctly, Good For We was on there. Um, I'm the one I think he already had. No Illusions was on there. And I think this other track called Bring Your Love In Closer was on there. Right? So there was these three tunes. And Bring Your Love In Closer, I think, was played first. I think. I'm not sure. Actually, I'm not sure that it was that one. There was one other. I can't remember what the third one was. It's a banger, though. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's true. Yeah, hold on. Tap, tap, tap. Oh, I can't I can't I remember. I love the, the idea that it's on the DAT machine as well. <laughs> yeah, DAT. Here you go. So he, he plays it. And I remember he played the first tune. And I remember I looked underneath the table. And I was just like, okay. See, so I saw his foot going. You know, Merlin's got a thing. He stamps. He's like that. He stamps. So I was like, okay, his foot's going, okay. I was sitting there and it was me. It's like, I think, I don't know if Sarah, I think Sarah was there and Ned or Ned, yeah, I think was, like, we were just sat there and we were like that, just the three of us. And then um, this old woman, sort of, this woman comes in and she's, she just says, would you like some tea, sir? Would you like some tea, tea, tea? And we were all like, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, we'll have a tea. Thanks, thanks very much. Blah blah blah. So she, she walks off, and this guy carries on, and he starts. His second song plays. I remember thinking, okay, now because now I knew, home run. We're going from we're going. Second song is no illusions, and the third was like good for you or something. I remember where where this is gonna kill him. So no illusions comes in. Now at the time we had no idea really that we knew. I guess what our influences were and what we've kind of been influenced by, right? 
But what we did, what we didn't under, what we didn't know was that obviously Merlin was a DJ in America as well, and like a lot of the sounds that we've been influenced by, just hit his button straight. So the intro comes in, and you know he's a Paradise Garage person, you know all of that kind of thing, and of course it's a piano intro. And he's just, I saw his foot go, then his hand was going on the table. I was just like, oh, okay, this is really good. I think, and then we, I think we hit good for we or something. And I just remember thinking, that's it, it's done. It's got to be done, surely. Like this, I, you know. So he was just like, he pressed stop. He was just like, okay. He goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, we want to do this. And anyway, this old woman comes in, she comes in, she brings the tea, she hunch up, she brings the tea. We all drink him, we're like, blah. I just again, we're all like, thanks so much for the tea. We're just really great <laughs> English people, you know. We're just oh, please, please. And the old woman goes and sits in the corner like this, and we're like, yeah, okay, like that. And he's like, okay, he's like, yeah, we're really interested in this. And then the woman in the corner goes, yeah, we're really interested in this. And we turn, and this woman stands up, and she goes, and she swaps places. And it's Sylvia Rowan. Wow. Who got the team? Yeah. Wow. It's Sylvia Rowan. Wow. So we're like... Power play. First things first, we're like, we're like, thank God we were courteous. <laughs> right? Awfully kind of you. Exactly. It's <laughs> one of those. Tea. And it's funny enough, like, in, in lectures, when I'm lecturing in unis, I say, tea is very <clears> important. <throat> you know, your response to the person that mm. you think... Well, that, well, that whole thing was a, is a life lesson. Yeah. That whole... Yeah. yeah. No. Absolutely. So, and she just went, she just sat there and she just literally took the meeting. She was like, okay, okay. Wow. So, uh, and she just started in that Sylvia Rome way and just said, look, we're going to do this. We really like what we've heard and bam. And we were just really pleased that they didn't want to mess with it. Mm. That was our thing. We just so didn't want it messed with. I mean, maybe part of that tactic that she used there was to kind of see how, how you were, see if you're going to be like, Problem artists or anything Probably, like that. Yeah. Just to see if you, you know, if you're grounded and stuff. Well, she said she had. She, they, she said afterwards they had had some trouble with some of the acts that they come and seen, and she was just like, nah, yeah, who, who, who was kind of twat. <laughs> yeah, basically. So that was it. So yeah, and they went off, and we still were like, really, is this going to happen? And they sent through the deal to our lawyer. You know, we negotiated negotiated up a bit, and. But was this quite like ninety one? Yeah, this is this is ninety. Ninety. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So and then we we start, you know, we start making a record basically. Yeah. So to put all this in context in terms of Touch Magazine, one of the things that we did Touch Magazine was we heavily championed British music, which now seems a bit weird because like British music dominates mm. the world, and even though Soul to Soul had broken through and you know, mm. there'd been loose ends before them, it, it was still the exception rather than the rule, and and a lot of the press focused on US artists, particularly yeah. in black mm. music and soul music, whether it be hip hop or whether it be soul or whatever, it was always about the American artists. And radio. And radio, yeah. yeah. And we always focused on uh, a Touch yeah. magazine on British. So talk, talk about why we did that and, and how difficult it was and, and why we picked up on the influence on the Well, I think it was difficult to focus on British music because I think Kwame put it very well when he talked about going, when the Americans call on the house phone <laughs> and like, that the British industry could easily have never heard of you. They yeah. probably had never heard of you. Yeah. And you have to remember, at that time, the British music industry was in a very, very sorry state. It was basically full of rock dinosaur people. They had no, it didn't matter. Jazzy B could have a, a global hit, yeah. you know, but they still don't care. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Hip hop is the biggest in the world. They still don't care. Yeah. So for a British artist like you yeah. and your, you know, your, 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 your people around you, and also for all the people that we all were interested in, you know, the Omars, the Donnies, the, yeah. you know, this incredible wave of like, real talented artists are coming through and just, it's all for all deaf ears in, in here. So I think probably our agenda as a magazine was that we were trying in our small way, as much as we could, to promote and support the artists. But it was quite hard to do that in a vacuum where there was no radio support, there was no television, obviously it was pre-internet, pre-social media, so the idea that you could create a movement out of this incredible stuff, but we're all clubbers, and so we're all in the clubs, mm. and so we're all hearing this stuff, and like we're hearing 
mainly American music, mainly hip hop, early yeah. house. You know, we hit boogie. You know, and we, it is mainly American, yeah. but a whole generation is being influenced. Um, creators like you and mm. musicians, and there's this incredible stuff coming out. But what there's this massive vacuum in the middle where no one's supporting it and no one's promoting it, and it's almost like. And probably even like if I'm going to be real about it, probably even the pirates, you know, and even the black music press in Britain is quite American orientated. Really, black music press. And you know what? You know, we all love that music. Now, like, obviously, we all grown up on Luther Vandross and Steve Wonder, you know, and we love all the the new stuff that's coming through. So it's all great, but there's this kind of like vacuum where it's weirdly it's kind of it's not that it's obviously it's our world, but it's people we know. It's people we would literally yeah. see in a club, mm. and you would say to someone, "Oh," and you'd hear a record because if you're a DJ, Kwame will come and give you a, you know. Yeah. So it would actually be there, and I guess the one bit of that jigsaw puzzle that we as a magazine were trying to fall um, to fill was to say, "Oh, there's always some amazing stuff. Come and read about it here." And you know, Touch started off with very low-level ambitions. It would never. It wasn't trying to be. Um, you know, a, a kind of you know, the be all and end all. It was just like, there's all this stuff, you know about it because you work in that record shop, you work in that record shop, you're a DJ, <coughs> you're a plugger, you're a distributor, so come and write about the stuff that is out there. And it was it was that simple. <coughs> and I think that was the, um, really that was the genesis. And I guess the two timelines c- converge where we were doing that and it's very early days for us. And, you know, Kwame and Dean were quite a new thing that was coming through. But there was a lot, you know, there was a lot of really interesting under, you know, we call it underground. I mean, it is underground. Because mm. no one's, it's only underground because no one's writing about it. No one's talking yeah. about it. It's not on the radio. It's not on the telly. Yeah. So no, no, no one sits out to make, I'm going to make an underground record. People just want to make music, don't they? They want to make art. They want to make, they want to have their voice heard. But you become underground because no one's listening to you. Mm. And I guess the difference between then and now is that now everyone can be heard because they can find the channel. Yeah. And I think probably then if we did one thing well, it was just to create a small platform in a very analog, literally printed word way, mainly black and white and occasionally colour where we could afford a colour section more than very often. But it was just to kind of there's it was just here's some amazing music, listen to it. Or here's a great DJ or here's a great person or who's a, an amazing stylist and let's put it in the magazine and put it out there and so I think the two things coincided but I, I do think it's very telling and, and, and actually a real indictment of the industry and also really the media is that all this stuff is right there under your very noses but you're not interested because it's not from Detroit or Philadelphia or New York or LA and you lot were doing that like, amazing stuff, you know. And there was a lot of amazing new artists coming through who were generationally from, you know, your generation, kind of influenced by hip hop. You know, obviously everyone's growing up with the greats. Mm. So you've got that canon, you've got that um, that world of um, influence there. But then suddenly there's hip hop, and there's um, all this interesting stuff happening. And I think it was. Um, no, it was the it was the pirate stations and like the the the, the, the I guess the the countercultural media that tried to promote it um, in a way that nobody else was doing. And I think one really important thing that I think is worth pointing out, because in, again, in, put it in context, is that it wasn't just that we talked about the the artists in the magazine. We did something which was totally against the grain. You know, because I remember long editorial meetings when we used to discuss it. It's totally against the grain is we put these artists on the front cover. Mm. We didn't put like established, well-known artists. Well, we did for a bit, but we, we actually went out of our way to start mm. putting, and we put the influence on the front cover, I can't remember when it was, but. Well, it was so long ago, but it was free magazine. It was free. Oh, was it? it was yeah, we were free. As me and Kwame talked about the other yeah. day, actually, the influence was so like, on the on the on the ground floor of Touch, that it was like they're all, they're already stars. As far as we know, <laughs> they're already established. Like, they didn't on the cover. The people on the cover, were people no one had ever heard of, like Donny, or you know, people who then went on to become do amazing things. But actually, they were like they 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 had that penetration already. And um, yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. Is that the, the what's the point of put if someone's already famous? Why would you put them on the cover? What I now know is that oh, you put them on the cover because that makes you so 
a billion yeah, copies yeah, 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 rather than you know twelve copies. Um, but we didn't know that then, and, and that's probably a good thing. Yeah. So we're well, back to the influence now. Now you're signed to Warner Brothers. Yeah. Um, you're putting together your first album. Yeah. You released the first album. Fantastic album. Hits home. Tell us what happened. How did what? Tell us about the journey. Okay. So the first thing, the first thing that happens is we're recording. We're putting the first album together. Good for we. Good for we. Yeah. We're putting it all together and working through it and everything. And uh, Ned Bigham, who had been uh, like a, just this amazing ace one drum programmer, you know, lived for swing, as he used to call it. He's all about swing. Ned used to say, oh, the swing in this record, the swing, yeah, we've just got to really get this, it's, it's got enough swing. It was always, you know, and he was amazing. And he just, just, I think as we were, we were getting close to, about halfway through maybe the first album and I think he just said no I'm not gonna I'm not gonna carry on with this journey so I was gonna ask because if you got signed in 1990 the album didn't come out until 92 did yeah, it? So, yeah yeah so he was just like yeah I'm not gonna carry on with this journey and we were like what <laughs> but we were like all right we've got to respect it if that's he doesn't feel that he can he, he thought all right so we're like wow okay um, and in steps Ed. So Ed is, is one of these, you know, it's very, very sort of high IQ people that can pick up things quick. And he just set to learning how to program and everything. Um, drums, especially, because that was the area that we needed it in. And um, so that he sort of learned to do. And um, Ned had already done quite a lot of the album, really. He'd already done quite a lot of the album, but there were still maybe a few things. And um, yeah, Ed comes in and just becomes this, this, this sort of trooper. So Ed was loosely in, in it anyway, because he had, he had played on various, you know, I'm the one, he had played on various things. Uh, but he was, at, he was at uni. So he was sort of doing it in and out, you know, some things he could be on, other things. And, and then it basically came to pass that he could, you know. So he, Ned, it was really weird. This, I, I mean, I remember it's a blur, but sort of Ned departs, Ed's there in it, and we just carry on. And because it was that thing of, I think Sarah had a convo with me and was like, what are we going to do? Well, you know, and we were just like, well, in fact, Steve, who... To me, Steve's like the founder member, really. You know, Steve's the person that kind of got me in that room at the time, and then blah, and he was like social butterfly. You know, glue, we call it. You know, it's kind of... But he was very much like, that. you know, we're just going to... We're just going to carry on. We're just going to... You know. So we just did. You know, and... And uh, we did the album. Um... That doing the doing the records, it was so much about it was inspiration. So we'd be in the studio. It's be a lot of fun, a lot of laughing, a lot of this, a lot of people would be passing through, blah, this, that, whatever, and we'd just be making the tune up generally as we go, you know. Um, but we'd been handing stuff in, and the label had been going, yeah, yeah, it's all right, but it's not the single. Oh my. So we're like, yeah, yeah, we hand in another tune. Like, yeah, yeah, it's all right, it's not the single. You hand in another tune. Yeah, yeah, it's all right. It's not the same. We're like, wow. And uh, I don't think we realised at first. You know, it was that was them. That East West Way. They just used to just bat you back. This is why it took to May too. Like the first three quarters of a year, they were just going. They won't interfere, but they'll keep sending you back to the studio. Yeah, <laughs> just like no, 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 no. And then they were like, listen. And this was the sort of Damocles moment. They basically went like. If you can't deliver what is the single, we might have to put you in with someone. And we were Ooh. like, <laughs> we were like, Jimmy Jam and yeah. Terry Lewis. <laughs> yeah, at the time it was really like, oh no, no, no. And they were desperate to get us in with Delhi Hooper, desperate, because they just figured, Nelly, soul to soul, Nelly, let's go. Yeah. And we were really, I mean, really stubborn. We were just like, no. <laughs> No, 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 no. And they were like, well, deliver the single then. 
and um, <laughs> we had this studio session and all sorts happened oh, gosh, yeah. all sorts I mean we had we had a backing track we had the sort of makings of this chorus that we had spliced from like an old song Mr Right we had spliced bits of the, oh, when I say spliced I mean just chopped bits of the vocal round mm. and made it make sense into this chorus and then got Sarah to sing over the top of it and we would yeah and but we just could verse wise we just couldn't come with anything and it had reached half past two you know like the states had called and they were like look just get out of the studio if you can't think you're wasting time you're wasting money just get out and we were just like whoa 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 and about, so the pressure was on now. Yeah, about half two, three o'clock. You know, we were like, come on, come on, come on. And Sarah was like, come on, is that like, blah, blah, blah. And she just went, feelings deep. And we were like, that's it, that's it, that's it. Because she tried a various combinations of things that just didn't sound like right, mm. you know. And she just started that. And we were like, yeah, yeah, more of that, more of that. And she just, kept and we were like right yeah here it is here it is and it was early wee hours of the morning you know and she you know it just kept coming kept coming and then we were like right we've got this other section da 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 right the direction right okay yeah yeah and it just it was weird it took that one took ages to get the the vocal bit but when the vocal bit came it just came it was like a dump Literally, it was like someone just went, there you go, there it is. And we just had to be there to catch it. And mm. and that was it. It was the, literally, it was done. Like, vocal, blah, this, that. It was all done. It was done quite quickly. And then we really had to, because it was like, all right, how are we going to really twist people's back with the bass line? So we went back in our you know, bass line. And remember, Wayne Brown helped out with the bass line. It was the, the, uh, it was the engineer, you know? I come with one bit, he come with another, you know, and we would stitch bits together and it was just like, right, right. It's like a patchwork quilt, you know? And it, it just all just hung together. And it was another one of these things as a tune where, as you say, it didn't really, it wasn't house, it wasn't X, it wasn't Y, well, it wasn't hip hop, it wasn't blah, it wasn't, but it worked in everyone. Mm. You know, so. No one owns it, everyone loves it. Yeah. Yeah, so we were just like, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So we then send this to America. And this is? Good Lover. Good lover. Yeah, so we send it to America. And uh, we send it to America. And uh, for about three, four days, nothing. And then... Merlin, At least they didn't send you back to the studio. <laughs> and then Merlin, I'm thinking about it. Yeah, and then Merlin, <laughs> the the jury's rock. out. <laughs> and then Merlin calls back and he just goes, yeah, okay, you got one. He goes, you oh, got that's one. That's cool, man. You got one. Like this. And, yeah. and then, who was it? Graham Park? Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Was sent it by Spencer Baldwin, uh, who was at East West Records in, in the UK, mm -hmm. who, who was our sort of sister company, really, in the UK. Yeah. And Spencer Baldwin sends it out to uh, Graham Park, who starts playing it at the Hacienda. And we just start getting these reports back that it's kicking off. Yeah, it's being played and played and played and played. And we're like, what? What? Like mm -hmm. this. And then it really, it just starts to spread, you know. Um, I'm not sure which one of the tunes, I'm not sure because I can never remember which one. One of the tunes was on, a, the, when was the KISS broadcast? They had a reel that just kept going around. Oh, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, yeah, September 90, 90, 90. 90. Yeah. Was that ninety? Yeah, and I think that was there was. Um, so that was. I think Good Love was on. No, I'm like, the one. Was, I'm the one. I'm the one. I think yeah, I'm yeah. the one was on that. Yeah. So that was really weird because it assured us this amazing amount of radio play because mm. it just kept going round and round and round. So people were like, "You're on the radio all the time." So there was that, but with Good Lover, Good Lover was just like it just like that summer it just went, and then. We th so the, the a lot of it was being played off of the DAT. So then it starts this giving pressed, and we were like, oh, we're like we should do a remix, you know. So this is where the whole so we're we're like right, okay, we should do a remix. And and funny enough, Ned was still involved 
with us at this point. And he comes in, Ned comes in, and he had just done this drum beat. And I just remember going, wow, like the drum beat, you know, that it was so like again, hip hop, boogie, blood, all in at this intersection. Mm. And you know, <laughs> as they do, Sarah, Steve, <coughs> blah, they're like, come on, baseline, 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 because that's my thing, right? So I was just like, okay, okay. Um, and it, again, it's one of those things where you're playing. I remember they chopped up, I wanted a real sort of bass sound. So they chopped up a person actually playing, the duck, 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 chopped it up and put it over across the keyboard. So I could basically play it. And I played it like I'd imagine a bass player would play it. So it was dun 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 And I, it, I just, as I was playing it, this is the thing, when you've got, like Sarah, you can always tell. Because if I'm playing a bass line and she starts dancing and screaming, then you know it's on. So that's what happens. You know, <laughs> she starts dancing, she starts screaming, then you know, and your pals playing it, and I was just like, yeah. And they were like, yeah, keep going, keep going. So I'm playing it, playing it, playing it, playing it. They don't, they don't, don't worry, we'll let it later. Because you know? I was made some mistakes and blah, and they were just like, don't worry, we'll let it later, we'll let it later. So I played it. And again, so you had that bit, then you had Steve. Steve now goes in, he's like, right, okay. I'm just gonna warm up. So he plays the saxophone like, all the way down the track because he's warming up. And we go, wow, it's a great tape, do it again. So he's like, yeah, so he's like, so we're like, whoa, okay, Steve, this is great, great, okay, like this. And uh, we're like, right, well, we're obviously gonna edit and choose the best bits and blah. And this engineer, Benjamin Robbins, we named him Jamin, because his real name's Benjamin. We're like Jamin Robbins, right? So we said, he was like, listen, he said, you don't have to edit Steve's plan. We're like, what do you mean? He said, no, no, no. He said, watch. So he basically, he moved the faders down so that Steve was sort of, and then he put this reverb effect like over Steve's play so that he sounded like he was playing the saxophone just wildly in this cave, yeah. And we were like, right, okay, so the drums are up front, bass is up front, and then it was really, you know, literally, Sarah had already sung the vocal on the previous take. So he upped that and it just fit. The whole thing just fit together. And, um, you know, partly Ed, partly Ned, you know, it just all just fit together. And I just remember just thinking, God, blimey, you know. So at that point it was like, okay, cool. And the record label said, oh, what are you gonna name it? And we were like, oh, people have been behind this a lot. Yeah, we'll call it Touch. <laughs> and that oh, was yeah, it. the Touch Mix. It was called <laughs> Touch Mix. mix. Yeah. And that was it. And again, yeah. it went, it went on the record. Yeah. And uh, it was on the 12th. It was never put on CD. It was always just on the 12th. And it smacked it, yeah. clubs-wise. It, it, it was a real club hit, wasn't it? Yeah, it literally, I just remember thinking, okay. You started with a break. Yeah. And like, any of it's on the break, you know you, you got them already. Yeah, yeah. And I just, again, it was one of those ones. I was in a couple of Fresh and Funky, which was at the borderline. I was in Fresh and Funky, and I just remember I was standing there. And my wife, Maura, or who was my wife, she was my girlfriend then, was DJing there. And she just played it. And she played it again. And by about the second or third week, people were screaming for it. I just remember, you know, it, they'd play the break, just the intro, and people were screaming and they'd stop yeah. it and start it again. And so I, at that point, I just used to stand and, and, and start standing in the corner and just watch people move to it and just think, Christ, what an amazing feeling that you've done as a band, you've done something that makes people so happy. 